God is going to punish you. So give verse 14. We find a prophecy that is being fulfilled in the last days. Let's take our Bibles and read Isaiah 32 verse 14 together. Isaiah 32 14. I believe we've all located it. And it says the following, For the fortified tower has been forsaken, the noisy city has been abandoned. Awful and the watchtower have become a permanent wasteland, a delight for wild donkeys, a pasture for the flocks. Did you notice the prophecy being fulfilled? The watchtower has become a permanent wasteland. How are these words being fulfilled today? Recently, all the bodies of elders received a letter discussing a monthly resolution. We're talking about around $10 that should come out of each publisher's pocket every month. It almost sounds like a monthly subscription. This matter, friends, is not new. These letters have always been sent when we're at the end of the service year. But the problem is this. If everywhere they say donations are voluntary, What's the need for making a resolution? Did Christians of the first century also made monthly resolutions? Does the example of the widow who offered two small coins no longer apply nowadays? I'm confused. But in this video, John Ekron will explain to us better how money is used in the organization. Please subscribe and share the video. I've included information in the description of this video that might be useful to you. Now, let's listen to John Ekron talking about money. Well, what effect have lovers of money had on Christendom and false religion? Well, once Christendom's priests or ministers started to charge for their services or press their congregations very hard for money, it had a corrupting influence on the worship of God. Money changed how religion worked. It changed the relationship of people, ministers, to their congregation. I mean, to illustrate for a moment, think of a wife that goes to her husband and hands him a bill for all the work she's done in the family. And the husband turns around and gives her a bill for all the work he does in the family. Do you think that might change the relationship in the family? about how they feel about one another and the work they do? Uh, of course it would. Jehovah inspired Paul to see the corrupting influence that lovers of money would have on religion in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 3 and 4. Well, today, as mentioned in these verses, many religions are based on tickle their ears messages, false stories, platitudes, and kind of feel good about yourself uh, messages. You know, when I searched on the internet for the effect of money on religion, I came across several websites that explain how to form your own religion, what to say, what to do, with the whole purpose of getting rich. So once a religion is run by lovers of money, they're no longer lovers of truth or lovers of God's word. Sermons are no longer about Bible truth. They're more about what people are willing to pay for. People are even told that they can buy God's uh, forgiveness. Basically, you can bribe God not to punish you. It kind of goes like this. You've done bad. God is going to punish you. So give money to me and the church and God will forgive you. You see, this scam and variations of it have a long history. Indulgences sold by the Catholic Church back in the 16th century are very good examples of such greed. Indulgences were basically the church saying, you can pay for God not to punish you. The Awake, August 1988, explained how Martin Luther felt about the Catholic Church selling such indulgences. It says, the selling of indulgences originated during the Crusades when they were granted to believers willing to risk their lives in a holy war. But later, they were extended to people offering financial support to the church. Soon, indulgences became a convenient method of raising money, the bingo of the 16th century. With the sharp tongue for which he became noted, Martin Luther asked, 
if the Pope does have the power to release anyone from purgatory, basically on the basis of indulgences of the money, why in the name of love does he not abolish purgatory by letting everyone out? End of quote. Well, this really should not uh, surprise us. The biggest bribe on record was the one Satan offered to Jesus. Satan said, I will give you, bribe you, all the kingdoms of the world, basically pay you if you fall down and do an act of worship to me. Now let's contrast uh, Satan's and Christendom's view on love of money with Jesus' words at Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8. Now here Jesus was giving some instructions to his disciples about the message uh, they should give as they go out and preach the kingdom. And he told now, why after stating these beautiful, wonderful things they could do for people, would Jesus say something like, you receive free, give free? Because Jesus knew that the love of money could corrupt these wonderful miracles that they could do for others. I mean, Jesus had seen how money had corrupted many over the years he had seen mankind. For example, when he saw, when Naaman, wanted to give expensive gifts to Elisha because he had cured him of his leprosy, Elisha would not have any of it. See, Elisha knew that it was wrong to try to profit from the operation of God's Holy Spirit. Gehazi, though, he couldn't resist. His love of money totally corrupted his faithful service. Of course, today we can't uh, cure leprosy or uh, raise the dead. But the lesson that Jesus gave here in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8 is still very applicable to us. You received free, give free. It's a clear message. Don't accept money for the work of the Holy Spirit. And the kingdom message and its blessings are simply not for sale. Now, we're truly blessed to be part of God's Spirit-directed organization that are lovers of God uh, rather than lovers of money. We don't have collections at our meetings or our conventions. Donations are made discreetly, and funds are used wisely and modestly. And we also follow the Bible's requirement for elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that says that elders should not be a lover of money. See how important it is that the elders, those taking the lead, should not be a lover of money. Otherwise, it can corrupt their relationship with the congregation. Interestingly, that expression, that they should not be a lover of money, is the same expression that's used in 2 Timothy 3 about what other people would be as lovers of money. And that's the only time that expression, lovers of money, are used in the scriptures. See, when we see the corrupting influence that lovers of money have had on business, government, and false religion, it teaches us a very powerful lesson. Money has its proper place in our wallets, but not in our hearts.